know him for his political cartoons, but I bet you didn't know a lot of his background. So I'm going to read you some of his background. I was very impressed. Yeah. <laughs> Tim's professional career began in uh, New, York, New York City's Madison Avenue as assistant art director for Kenyon and Eckhart ad Advertising, where he helped illustrate, design, and produce print, print and television advertising for clients, including Ford Motor Company, Helena Rubenstein, Major League Baseball, Paps Beer, and many others. His primary account was the Lincoln Mercury division for Ford. During this time, he, also, he was also a freelance illustrator, illustrating books and many national magazine articles. Tin left the ad agency to become art director of Forbes magazine for six years, helping to win a first place award for best redesigned national magazine. You did. <laughs> That's good. Since returning to Vermont in the 80s, Tim's been based in Montpelier, operating as Newcomb Studios. He designs, designed, and still design, publications, annual reports, scientific reports, logos, packaging, websites, etc., for US and global clients ranging from Sony and then something, N-E-I-W-P-C-C. -C. What is it? Oh, OK. <laughs> I should have known that, <laughs> really. <laughs> the Climate Cabinet and EPA to Vermont organizations such as the Lake Champlain Basin Commission, the Nature Conservancy, VNRC, and the Vermont Land Trust. Tim is also a cartoonist, having had editorial and illustrative cartoons printed in newspapers, including the Boston Globe, the Wall Street Journal, and the New York Times, to many national magazines. He received a first place award for best regional political cartoon from the New England Press Association, and has won first or second place in the annual Association of Alternative News Media Awards uh, for the last five years winning first place in 2022. Anything else? <laughs> oh, that's great. Tim Newcomb. This is my best cartoon yet. Oh, <laughs> wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. All right. There we go. Do I, do I have to point this over there? Or is it, is it, I guess I'll figure it out. All right. Well, at any rate. Use the microphone. Oh, right. OK. I'm not, I'm not used to doing this. I, I don't speak publicly very often at all. Um, yeah, so anyway, thank you all for coming. A uh, couple first things. Um, I have brought a pile of books, and I have more in my car, which uh, I would love anybody to take. They're free. The price is right. Um, so there's a stack of them. And I've, I've got even more in my barn, so. <laughs> Uh, so please, please do take them. They make great fire starters. Uh, and, and also, uh, during the course of this, I probably got too many cartoons queued up here. But uh, please, I, I would really welcome it if, if people had questions or comments or uh, wanted to throw things at me or, or whatever during the talk. So rather than just be some, you know, me blathering into this microphone for a while. So seriously, please uh, feel free to... Say anything you want. <laughs> uh, all right, so at any rate, um, I figured it was best to start out at the beginning. <laughs> this is where my, uh, my career as a cartoonist and caricaturist was really very clear. <laughs> That's my dad, obviously. <laughs> spitting image, the poor guy. Whoops, wait a minute, I skipped one. I, 
And that, as my, my dad has written down there, this happens to be mommy. <laughs> Again, you know, a killer caricature if there ever was one. <laughs> the spiral eyes, be, uh, anyway, yeah. Anyway, so I, I started off, I, you know, I always liked to draw. As growing up, I do superheroes, and I was a big fan of Mad Magazine, and uh, loved uh, Don Martin, and you know, I, I really studied a lot of these people. And got to high school, and uh, had, had this, you know, you could see the, the mature adolescent mind at work at here. Uh, I, I did a book for our, my high school class, uh, of commentary on my uh, on the high school and, and the class, and I couldn't find the book. It's it's at home somewhere, and all I had was this was the big fold out. This was the coup de grace of the book, <laughs> you know, in a tenth grader's mind. Uh, Chatham Township High School in New Jersey. Uh, t my, I grew I grew up all over the country. My dad was a uh, rising young executive for a division of W.R. Grace, and he was transferred every year to two years. So I grew up in the Midwest, down south, whereby when I was in elementary school, I had a real southern accent. So, you, know, you had to say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. And then we moved from there to New Jersey, where that was not on. <laughs> so, I, so I lost that accent pretty quickly. And, and then he, he ended up dying of cancer young, so we stopped moving as a result for a while. And so I spent my entire high school, most of my high school career in, uh, in Chatham. <coughs> um, so I was drawing at that point, but I was also painting. And this was, I also did in 10th grade. Uh, and there's some, it needs to be cleaned. There's some stuff dripping on it, but. Um, those were not uh, Vermont mountains. Then <laughs> um, after high school, I, w I went to Kenyon College, uh, where um, I was going to major in art, but uh, I don't know. It, it just was starting at ground zero. And I was really interested in history and ended up being a history major, but I studied art the whole time. And while I was there, that's me in the middle, by the way. <laughs> uh, uh, I. After my freshman year, I got a job, because I had such a great time at Kenyon, I didn't want to leave. So a few of my friends and I stayed there and got a job with the maintenance department, and they had me paint a mural on the wall. Wow. And that actually is, in my head, was Vermont. I, I don't know where the orange sky came from, but, um, you know, it, it, was, it was 1970. <laughs> Um, anyway, and those there, I'm flanked by my two daughters, uh, who both also went to Kenyon, so hence we're there oh. next to this mural. Um, Is the mural still there? The mural still is there, amazingly. Uh, somebody told me they had painted over it, but uh, we, I just went to Kenyon, Kenyon College. Oh, yeah, yeah. oh, excellent. Well, there you go. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, sadly, I guess I'm in a crowd. I, I don't have to be bashful about uh, aging myself. I just had my 50th college reunion and the painting was still there. So it was pretty amazing. It's been there, yeah. So it survived 50 odd years. Um, so after Kenyon, uh, I, I went to, well, during, uh, while I was at Kenyon, um, uh, I took a junior year abroad and, uh, and went to Ireland. Uh, this just in terms of kind of a background of getting uh, more clued into politics and uh, the world situation. And so it was in Ireland in uh, 1972 when it was uh, the period of the Troubles, as they call it. Uh, and there, I was in Dublin, and there were a lot of car bombings. And my host father uh, would drive me up to Northern Ireland just so I could experience what, what that was like for people, you know, and this conflict between Southern Ireland and, and the British the nor and Northern Ireland. So at that point, I had never really gone through checkpoints with machine guns pointed at me, so that was a uh, kind of an eye-opener. And I stayed there for the first semester, and uh, the school was just really easy, and because my dad had died, I, college was on my, you know, my nickel. So I just thought, you know, if I'm going to be paying Kenyon 
tuition fees to go to the school. It was so easy. I thought, I'll, I'll save it and go back and pick it up at Kenyon. So uh, the second half, I, I had a, a girlfriend at Kenyon uh, who who's, was my girlfriend. It was pretty, and she had incredibly interesting parents. Um, her dad was one of the editors of the New York Times, <coughs> and her mother was a foreign correspondent for Newsweek. And he had um, covered the development of the State of Israel for the New York Times and had lived over there. And so Lucy, my girlfriend, and her brother were bo born overseas and grew up in Libya and Israel. And uh, the family was just extremely political. And, uh, and, uh, and so going over to their house for dinner and whatnot, I mean, there were all these, these fascinating people like the U.S. Secretary of State, people just happened to be there for dinner, and uh, and it just it just this consciousness of world politics and uh, conflict and you know, all these these issues. It just it, it was just it's not the way I grew up. So it was it was a door open to the to an entirely different uh, way of looking at life, and and, and in the end myself. Um, so at any rate, after this uh, first semester of s that year, Lucy uh, was a religion major, and she went to Beirut, Lebanon, to to study. Um, and uh, so second semester, uh, we met in Greece, and then she went back to to Beirut, and I traveled overland through Turkey, and then down to uh, to Beirut, where I made my camp, and that was the beginning of '73, which was the beginning of the giant 73 war with Israel. And uh, so being there, I, I traveled in and out of um, uh, Syria quite a lot. I, I went to Syria like six different times, and uh, Jordan, and um, I, uh, well, and obviously traveled all over Lebanon. And, uh, and then the war started, and you know, we, you know, all kinds of stories, but lived through all kinds of missile attacks and mortar attacks and whatnot. And uh, so it just this whole thing of just world conflict, it was just it was kind of in my face that whole year. And um, came back and I blew uh, getting back into Kenyon because of my timing. And Well, actually, in between there, I, 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 when I finally was able to get out of Beirut, I went to Germany and worked in a, a medieval castle for about a half year. Um, and didn't speak a word of English the whole time, uh, which was great. And, um, and then went back and blew it and realized I wasn't going to get back to Kenya. So I, I uh, moved to Vermont and, uh, <laughs> and got a job working for the Rutland Tree Service, which uh, was great until January came. <laughs> and um, at any rate, so I, I decided it's, I, I was going to go back you know, finish college and then find something to do. I'd, I'd move back to Vermont when I actually had a profession, and, and not being climbing trees for the Rutland Tree Service. So why Vermont? What made you pick Vermont? Um, oh, I, no, one sec. I'm already getting a dry mouth. Um, in high school, I, uh, my senior year, we moved back to uh, Ohio where both of my parents were originally from, and uh, one of the one of my best friends in, in my art class there had a, an older brother who uh, lived in Waitsfield, had moved to Waitsfield, and was in this rock and roll band called Tank. If anybody's <laughs> been here a lot, you really? Does somebody remember? That? Really? Oh, and uh, <laughs> no, they were really good. Like they. Oh, really? Okay. All right. But well, they opened for the Jefferson Airplane, and I mean, they were, they were really successful. And um, so, but he was living with a, a woman on, who lived at Knoll Farm in Waitsfield. Yeah. And uh, so we went to uh, go visit, uh, my, this, my friend's name is Sheila, it was her, her, her brother, Michael. So we went, so my, my first trip, trips to Vermont were staying at Knoll Farm, which, you know, I just thought, oh my God, this is just, this is the most amazing gorgeous place on the planet. So I, I, and I remember actually, I mean back then, 73, uh, driving through Montpelier, and I had never been here before, and I, th and I just had this feeling. It was just, uh, it was in, I don't know why, we were driving through town, and I thought, 
this is where I'm going to live. This, this is, I, I've never been here, but we were just driving down State Street and thinking, I, this is home. This is, this is, no, it was not January. <laughs> it was not January. <laughs> <laughs> I just decided, decided to change it up and bring in floods instead, you know, at least, you know, it's way too dry. Um, at any rate, so after college, uh, I, I, Lucy moved to New York City, and, and I thought, well, I have to follow her, of course, but that was also where the jobs were. So after a lot of pavement pounding, I got this job at uh, Kenyon and Eckhart Advertising, oddly Kenyon and Eckhart, having just gone to Kenyon College. There was no connection. Um, and, and they hired me. I, they, I had no idea about commercial art. Uh, so I just basically lied my way <laughs> into, the, into the job. Uh, they, you know, they interviewed at the studio, and they said, well, do you know how to do paste-ups and mechanicals? I thought, what the, because I paced up in mechanical, so, oh yeah, no problem, piece of cake, I'm all over it, you know, and after the boss went away interviewing me, I said to the other people working, I said, what is a paste up in a mechanical, and they all thought it was funny, so they, but they hired me basically because of the illustrations, and those early on, you would be, um, we were doing TV commercials, uh, you, you'd start off with cartoons, basically, uh, you'd sketch out in a storyboard, just blocking out what would be the visuals for the TV um, commercial. So that was my job, is just doing all these uh, storyboards, whereby all, everybody in the commercial were, looked like cartoons, rather than the handsome you know, Lincoln Continental owners they were supposed to be. And, um, uh, the most nerve-wracking, I should get on with this car, I'm just blathering, the most nerve-wracking job, actually, it was the most unforgettable little illustration jobs was they, uh, one of the cars we advertised was the Mercury Cougar, and they had this little logo of the Cougar head, and this is back, you know, it's in the 70s, the people still did this kind of thing, where they, they decided the way to get the, the viewer's attention was they, they wanted... Uh, what would look like a tattoo on th the breast of a supermodel. So they brought in like a Victoria's Secret uh, supermodel and I had to sit and flawlessly <laughs> <laughs> illustrate this, <laughs> this, this cougar head, you know, on, on the breast of this supermodel. And I just thought, and I mean, I was sweating and shaking and, I, I managed to pull, and they said, you can't keep redoing this. <laughs> no erasing, you know. Uh, so I, uh, but I did that, and uh, uh, I illustrated books, including uh, Alan Kaufman's Beginning Old Time Fiddle book, uh, uh, which is still in print, and, and said Lucy is one of the models in the book, and... Uh, uh, at any rate, what's next here? You've been staring at this boat long. Oh, well, I, I was doing that because one I, I was illustrating for Flying and Boating magazine, spot illustrations. There's this thing. There we go. So that was just that was one of them. Whoops. I've got to learn how to do this. So that's me at Forbes. <laughs> Proving that I actually did have dark, curly hair at one point. Um, uh, Oh, this is getting all out of, wait a minute. All right, I'm missing something here. All right, well, it doesn't matter. That's me at Forbes. At any rate, so after a while, uh, the, Lucy, uh, this girlfriend, was uh, going to be getting a PhD in Middle Eastern, or in international relations and Middle Eastern studies. And uh, she decided we were gonna move to Cairo, or she was gonna continue her, her studies, and uh, she was gonna be uh, sp learning how to speak. We both picked up a lot of Arabic in the Middle East. And while I was there, oh, that was, uh, Forbes made me the art director for the Arabic edition, um, which w we always, which worked out well because we were going to be moving to Cairo. I lined up a job with Al-Haram, which the, the daily newspaper in Cairo, 
and then she was going to be uh, studying at the university in Arabic and Hebrew. <coughs> and um, but before, right before we left, she got cold feet about the whole thing, and the relationship blew up. So rather than go to Cairo, I decided I'd been working really hard, saving money for all this, that I would head the other direction and talk to Forbes. And they said, we'll feel free to take a one, two-year leave of absence. And I said, well, my idea was I was going to travel around the world and take a couple of years to do it. And they said, great. We've got all these photo assignments we'd love to give to you. So imagine having one of these careers you walk around taking photos. <laughs> like, who, who does that? <laughs> so it was great. So they, they gave me, I don't know, a dozen, a couple dozen photo assignments just around the world. And uh, uh, yeah, people in places they just wanted for file f photographs. So, so I took off. And uh, is there just a delay on this, or am I just stupid, or yeah, both? There we go. So I, I traveled around, went through the South Pacific, went down to, uh, to New Zealand, where I, I met the person who happily replaced Lucy, who's sitting in the front row here. Um, and then went from there through Australia. I went up. Part of the trip was in, on New Guinea. Uh, the eastern half was Papua New Guinea. And then the western half, which where this is, uh, which at that point was called Irian Jaya. Um, and I hooked up, uh, that's the wrong word to use these days. <laughs> I met a, a guy who I ended up traveling with, Axel Benzmann, who was a, a German documentary filmmaker. And, uh, and he was doing a documentary to go into the uh, basically the uncontacted areas. Irian Jaya was just, I mean, at that point was still largely uncontacted. And uh, so the two of us uh, were supposed to get military permission, and we didn't get it, and ended up hitchhiking a ride with a, a missionary who was going in and went into the interior. And, uh, and we ended up, it was all kinds of, too many stories. And this is not about, it's, somewhat revolved around cartoons because just my, you know, this awareness of political, international um, s stuff. Uh, at any rate, uh, while, while we were there, it, this was just, a, it was an interesting part of the trip because it, it was, we discovered in talking to people that uh, Erie and Jaya is a very mineral rich area and it was just ringed with lots of oil and all, uh, precious metals and whatnot. So the Western world had a great interest in Erie and Jaya, which was at that point controlled by Indonesia. There was the island of New Guinea was split up after World War II. The eastern half was Papua New Guinea. The western half belonged to Indonesia. And Indonesia wanted the people out. So the U.S. was complicit by supplying um, Vietnam surplus napalm, and we're going around eradicating all the tribes, most of whom had never had any, uh, any clue that there was an outside world, and just systematically eradicated these, these tribes of people, and, um, which was just, you know, I was horrified about. And, uh, and we talked to a lot of the people, some survivors and whatnot, and people were just really lit up about independence and what the West was doing to them. And it was just another one of these things where I just, it, one of these political situations that was just astounding. You never hear about this. I mean, no, you know, 99 out of 100 Americans had never even heard of Erie and Jaya, I'm sure, much less the fact that the US government was involved with that. So when I got back, I wrote a whole article for a magazine called Cultural Survival about this. But um, anyway, so that was a big thing. So there I am playing fiddle, which I play, which we could have brought, because there are some really great fiddlers in the audience. Um, Playing an Irish jig for some some villagers. Uh, anyways, after that, I ended up back in New York, and uh, Lucy's mom at that point uh, was working for the American Civil Liberties Union, and she got me going, doing editorial cartoons uh, to go along with them, the ACLU stories that she was writing. So this is that was one I, I did for some story about the New York City police raiding people's private files. Um, 
So then, after Sharon and I lived in New York for a while, we decided it was not the place we wanted to raise our kids, and it was time to move to Vermont, so we did. And I came up here, and um, the first place that started publishing my cartoons was the good old Washington world, <laughs> or now just the world. Um, uh, so, they st I, so I was doing some national stuff. This, this is one of my first attempts at something. Uh, this is another one, general <laughs> <laughs> stuff at, at a time when I mean, acid rain and, w and the fact that trees were absorbing a lot of the pollutants was uh, it was a big dry mouth. And of course, this and early on was this start to my favorite talk, but it's, uh, Vermont Yankee. And a little bit later, I'll have a whole series on that, the development of that character. But, but that that was a pretty early one. Um, uh, and I also worked on um, portraits. I went through a phase where I was enjoying trying to do more detailed portraits of people. So Jim Jeffords. Uh, and this is at a, at a point where, um, well, after we moved up here, I had uh, gotten a job working for International Coins and Currency. <laughs> and uh, so I, I worked for them as art director, running, running the art department, which is a bit of a come down from Forbes magazine. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I was very appreciative of the job and their health insurance coverage because we had the two girls that were in the previous photo were pa paid for with ICC's nice insurance policy. <coughs> so after I left them, I moved into an office uh, uh, above the Savoy, where I, I don't know where Rick is, but he's, there he is, Rick, um, uh, which was all kinds of fun. I was trying to find, while I was at the Savoy, I would do posters for Rick and Gary Ireland, and uh, I had one where I had, Ra somehow Reagan was involved, I, I don't know how I got Reagan in a, in a spool of a reel of film, but <laughs> somehow I worked Reagan into a Savoy poster, but, and I couldn't find it. I wanted, to, I wanted to scan and put it in here, but it wasn't there. I couldn't find it anyway. Um, so then, I mean, eventually in the Times Argus finally agreed to start running my cartoons, um, starting off with the heady salary of a dollar a cartoon, which is, <laughs> um, so I started off, and th this is, uh, uh, I don't know, this is early one, this is John Easton, I don't know if you remember the, oh, yeah. there was that, that commune in Island Pond that uh, he, he raided, and I don't know, it just seemed like a good cartoon idea. <laughs> Um, then, uh, I think Nat's here, <laughs> a member of this audience got me into this cartoon idea for this cover, <laughs> um, which was, I mean, I, I, I was so proud that, that you asked me to do this. I mean, I, um, so it was uh, an article on, this, this is Dick Snelling. I mean, Dick Snelling on the right and Dick Sodek uh, on the left. And, uh, and this was after they had, I don't know if you can remember the details probably better than I do, but uh, they were negotiating a Hydro-Quebec deal. And Dick Sodek at that point was um, a commissioner of public service <coughs> and involved in the negotiations with Governor Snelling. And this cartoon really caused a lot of trouble. <laughs> Uh, Dix, I had never had, this is where I really first learned about the effects of a political cartoon, or just, or a caricature, period. And I don't know I, if you remember, I, or Dick I said anything to me. He, oh my God, Dick Sodek, I, who I didn't know at that point when I drew the cartoon. And uh, uh, we, a good friend of mine was uh, Chris Owen, another <laughs> Worcester neighbor and good friend of mine who worked for Dick Sodek at the Public Service Department. And um, 
we I was trying to remember the name of this restaurant. It wasn't the Horn of the Moon this this time? I spent a lot of time at the Horn <laughs> of the Moon. Uh, it was where the um, the Thai restaurant is on Elm Street. Uh, it was where we're all. Well, it was before. It was. It was. Yeah. At any rate, I. I'm, I don't know why it was such a popular restaurant, and I'm forgetting the name of it now. But so, Chris and I. Chris said, "Oh, let's let's go to said restaurant for for lunch." So we were sitting down, and um, and in the door walked Dick Sodak. I went, "Oh no." And Chris Owen, whose wife is sitting, she may be complicit in this, I don't know. You know who you are. <laughs> um, Chris, being the troublemaker he is, uh, said, he stood up and said, Mr. Sodak, I think I'd like to, you to introduce, I'd like to introduce you to a friend of mine. I said, no, Chris, no. <laughs> Please, no. And, uh, so I stood up, and Dick Sodak just went scarlet. I mean, he was, I mean, just livid. He had his fist balled up, you know, and I, I was just kind of sputtering, as I do frequently. And uh, I finally just said, Dick, just plant one right. Just get it out of your system. <laughs> just, just have at it. And he... He, he's, he's a really good guy, and he, he thought, thankfully, better of it, and sat down. <laughs> and, uh, and later, I would run into him on the street, and, and he, he just went on about how, how this had affected him. I mean, it just was, um, because he had, I guess, just put on a lot of weight, and I, the whole thing, it just, I, it, I, I mean, I felt terrible, you know, that I, I made somebody feel so horrible about <laughs> And, and it took years, and we have some mutual friends, and so at, I remember one party, a dinner party, we sat back for, and everybody else was out yucking it up, and we just sit in the back room and just talked it out for about an hour. And after that, we became really good friends. And he is, the, he is a, a very, just a sweet guy. And we were on the board of directors of Capital City Concerts together, and, and you know, I've since been to his house for dinner, and, Whatnot. He's a great guy, but at any rate, it was just one of those times you just realize the power of these things. Of uh, yeah. so, and you know, and it's hard with in Vermont. You know, being a small place, you get to know everybody, <laughs> and you know, I mean, governors on down. It just it's so it's you're you're a lot more exposed than you know if you're just sitting doing national political cartoons and everybody. You know, you're never going to meet these people, and they're just from afar. So. So I've kind of concentrated on Vermont cartoons. One, because uh, the national ones are a dime a dozen, and we've got Danziger anyway, who keeps up with all that. And, um, and really nobody else is, is much doing. It, it Danziger does the odd Vermont cartoon on Sundays, but, uh, but otherwise, you know, it's kind of it for covering the state. Um, so anyway, so this is, I'll try to start whipping through these because there, there's way too many lined up here. But uh, So some of these early issues, the uh, Department of Energy was looking for a place to uh, deposit their spent nuclear fuel and Vermont was, what's that? Oh, is that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, there was a time where it was just kind of awful. I mean, even though we were busy producing the nuclear waste. Nobody wanted to take responsibility for it, so send, send it to Texas. So we thought, you know, well, we can tell the Department of Energy where to stick their fuel rods. <laughs> I didn't fill in the C other. <laughs> Uh, which brings us to this one. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I assume most people probably remember or know about this. This is back in 85, was it 85 or 86. Uh, uh, there were the, the, all the ski areas were developing really quickly and uh, wanting to build, just load the mountain sides up with condominiums and whatnot, and um, uh, the state 
thankfully has good environmental laws to, to uh, prevent you know, overdevelopment. And in this case, the mountain soils, which couldn't handle the uh, uh, sewage, basically. People weren't building mound systems. They were just, they were just having leach fields, and the soils couldn't handle it. So the Killington sponsored a bill in the legislature <coughs> which would allow them to spray uh, their yeah, the, the sewage through, well, treated sewage through their snowmaking machines. <laughs> and, and not all the ski areas were behind this, and, and kill <laughs> <laughs> so to speak. And, uh, and Killington was the sponsor of the bill, so I thought I put Killington on there because this, they were, they were the, the main energy behind this bill. And um, so I did this just thinking, so it was printed in the, in the Times Argus and the Rutland Herald. And I thought, okay, a few, few people will get a chuckle and that'll be the ad, that and nobody will think about it again. And uh, as it happened, I also did some freelance illustrations for a, a tourist magazine, I don't know, it was a Woodstock Common. I, I think it's been out of print for decades, but, uh, and the editor of Woodstock Common happened to be in uh, Preston Smith, who was the CEO of Killington at that point. That she happened to be sitting in his office when somebody came in with this cartoon. And he went ballistic. And since I was in the middle of a doi doing some illustrations for it, and when she went back to her office, she called me and said, I've, just, I've got to let you know, yeah, you're, this is, this, he is, President Smith is just livid. I mean, this is not, you're not going to hear the end of this. You know, and he's, he's threatening to sue. And I said, to sue? It's a cartoon. I mean, <laughs> and, um, and she said, I'm, te I'm telling you. I, so I, I called the editor of the Times Argus up and said, uh, just you know, heads up, I, you know, I, we may be getting sued over this. And, uh, and sure enough, in quick matter, they, they, the, the Times Argus and Rutland Herald were sued. And um, uh, uh, which was a little uncomfortable for my one dollar cartoon that they had a multi-million dollar lawsuit <laughs> and uh, well it's the and then at the time yeah uh, uh, I, I also had a um, whoops oh. well oh this this <laughs> that's right forgot about this in between uh, this is a bumper sticker that the sadly recently departed Bill Mayers uh, came up with, um, and at the same time as the, the, uh, as the cartoon. So the two of them, everybody just links the two of these, this bumper sticker and my cartoon together. And, um, yeah, <laughs> just, yeah, 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 with the right color. <laughs> and, uh, so, but, so at the time, I had a... Um, uh, a cartoon show traveling traveling around the state with Ed Corn and Jeff Danziger, and it just so happened that the next stop on on the tour was uh, I think it's also gone now the Moonbrook Art Gallery in in Rutland, in Rutland being Killington's backyard, and the the art gallery called and said, "Look, you've got to hang this cartoon." And I said, "Well, it's a subject of a lawsuit. I I mean." I don't know if that's a good idea. This is just going to be fanning the flames. And, um, and I talked to the Times Argus' lawyer, who, who they were great, just really great help, uh, all of them. Um, he said, well, if you don't hang it, that becomes kind of an admission of guilt, you know, that it is a libelous cartoon. And so he said, you better hang it. And, <laughs> s and, the, and the art gallery kept on saying, you know, we really want this cartoon. So. Okay, so I, I hung the cartoon, the, art, the show went down to Rutland, and it was hung, and they promptly sued me personally. <laughs> and I, uh, it was a little rough thinking I was going to go up against the corporation of Killington, you know, with, with you know, the $200 I had in the bank. I didn't think I was probably going to successfully fight that one. So I went to the ACLU. And um, and Scott Skinner at that point was the head of the ACLU, and um, and he took that on uh, uh, gleefully, and 
and and ended up just publicizing this thing. And uh, and uh, the next thing I knew, I, I went away on vacation to visit my parents or something for a week, and came back to ICC. Um, this is I, this is before I'd gone over the Savoy, and. Um, and I came back, my drawing desk was just covered with, with sticky notes, all these phone messages, you know, so-and-so from the Wall Street Journal, so-and-so from the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, San Francisco Chronicle. I mean, it went on, and I said, oh, come on, you know, ha, 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 very funny. And they said, no, 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 this phone's been ringing off the hook. And, and uh, uh, so I said, no, come on, you're really not serious. And with that, the phone rang. And, and it was Newsweek. And uh, <laughs> I said, what? And uh, so one after another, all these publications wanted to reprint the cartoon. <laughs> and uh, so good old Preston Smith, you know, rather than the, the cartoon just being seen by some Times Argus and Rutland Herald <laughs> subscribers, now was all over. It was the first cartoon ever to be published in the Wall Street Journal. And the New York Times ran it. I mean, I mean it was it, Miami Herald. It, it was all over the country. So it ended up being seen by millions and millions of people <laughs> rather than. Did you get more than a dollar? Yeah. Well, it, yeah, I got a raise. <laughs> it, it, it came out in the paper when they were interviewing about this lawsuit and that the ACLU was defending me. And the reporter. Um, said, well, how much did you get paid for this? And I said, uh, the Times Argus pays me a dollar. <laughs> uh, sorry, Steve, I, I don't mean to be disparaging, <laughs> but that was true. And um, uh, so uh, the editor, which I guess was Tom Slayton back then, uh, said, we'll give you a raise. We'll start paying you $5 a cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I thought, let's go to lunch. <laughs> At any rate, so um, long, and, long and short, the ACLU managed to, to get my personal lawsuit dismissed, thankfully. And um, the other lawsuit did grind through, and, uh, and the, the Vermont legislature drafted a bill, which was, ended up being called the Times-Argus Bill, um, which basically said, um, I mean, lawsuits like this, I mean, they, the people bringing the lawsuits knew that that while we still have them, our First Amendment rights, um, uh, that it, it, this was a completely legitimate thing, that they really didn't have a leg to stand on. But if they could sue the newspaper and bring a newspaper to its knees, it would really negate any kind of negative press. If somebody, a, a corporation or you know, a, a wealthy person, whoever, could, could wield that kind of leverage. So the, the Vermont legislature drafted this bill saying that if a corporation or a person, whoever, brings a lawsuit that is found then to be frivolous and, and without merit, that they would pick up the legal fees of the person or newspaper, whoever was being sued, therefore hopefully nipping that whole situation in the bud. But that did mean I had to go to the legislature and testify in front of the Senate and House Judiciary Committees, which not being somebody who did that, having to look at politicians down the table. Um, sorry, there's one over here. <laughs> He's trying to disguise himself, but I know who you are. <laughs> uh, I, was, I mean, it was terrifying, you know. I, you have, you know and it was really, it was very partisan. You know, the, the Republicans were all glaring down the table at me. <laughs> it was sitting there, and the Democrats were all looking. <laughs> but in, in the end, uh, the, the bill did pass, and I just had to have a couple sweaty afternoons at the State House. But at any rate, so yes, so, so they did a long half hour later, yes, they did lose. <laughs> yeah. All right, enough of that. So anyway, well, this is still good old Vermont Yankee. Um, and it was, I mean, a lot of this is not a whole lot to say. I just, half, the, half of them, I just like the drawings. <laughs> but at, at a time, and, and Bernie was just trying to glom onto more than being a mayor. 
Peter Smith and Dick Snelling. Um, oh, I, okay, and then this one. Th this cartoon is in there because uh, it's pretty, it didn't photograph. I used to draw back before, uh, it was a technical thing. You cartoons, to get a gray shade, you, there, you would draw these cartoons on, a, on pieces of paper that had uh, tiny little diagonal lines printed uh, in with a chemical that when you took a developer and brushed over it, it, it would, like a photograph, that the, these invisible lines would, would come up and give you what looked like a gray tone. Um, and this is really old. At this point, the developer is all getting all funky, so it's 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 it looks pretty awful at this point. At any rate, this was just a cartoon I had done. It was at um, uh, graduation time, and there had been you know one of these typical uh, sad graduation things where they'd be at a senior party, kids had been drinking, and you know, people got killed. So I just did this cartoon that said the annual unlearned lesson. When it appeared in the paper, they they cut off the caption. <laughs> And so ev everybody, the community, thought I was doing some cartoon. The, the class of 87, I guess that is. I, um, I, that I had some grudge against the class of 87. You know, they were all losers and they were all you know, drunkards and whatnot. And it was really horrible. I, and it was just, I took all kinds of grief. I mean, phone calls and letters. And, uh, uh, and I think it, the cartoon then re-ran later with the, or I guess I, what I, I wrote a, um, a column or a response, and then the, the cartoon was reprinted with a caption. But after that point, I started um, blocking all my cartoons, doing these borders. <laughs> so there wasn't any confusion about where to crop the cartoon. Um, uh, yeah, it was, it ju I just felt so terrible, terribly about that, that car accident thing. At any rate, it was just there. What's that? Oh, I mean it <laughs> yeah, yeah, it just said the, the, the annual unlearned lesson underneath of it, which was just to, ma to make it a general thing that every year, you know, it seems like you know, kids around the country, this happens. I mean, how, how often do you see these stories? And it's just sad. At any rate, so this is just another a national one. Oh, the, oh this is where... Um, yeah, I th where Leahy, uh, this is, uh, I, I left the text in there, but he was, uh, he, he had, I have to read the caption. Yeah, he, he had all these documents that were classified, and, but he wanted to leak the story but didn't want to be caught doing it himself. So I, I just loved it being that he he left all these classified things. He was being interviewed and said, "Oh, I've got to I've got to go to the bathroom or something or other." And so we so the reporters then, of course, read all this classified information in, information and went back and wrote about it. And he said, "Well, I didn't say anything. I I just left the reporters alone with the document." And I don't know. I just thought that was. Oh, uh, this is John McClowry. <laughs> uh, this this was one. Uh, not that it's a particularly great cartoon, but it's. Uh, yeah, well, I was probably gonna. That's gonna happen a lot. Yeah, I'm such an angle. I can't really. Pro. Yeah. And. He's ri he's right, and you're all out to lunch. So bug off, and um, so he I don't know, he was the head of the Vermont Republican Assembly, and then later the Ethan Allen Institute, um, and he on the tower. One of the things was uh, a burn. I God, I just can't read it from this angle. Yeah. And for this whole thing, he the, the thing that really got him was burning the Bill of Rights. So he ended up um, calling me, yelling at me on the phone, and then sending me a tie, 
it was a Bill of Rights tie. <laughs> he said, this is, a, I have a bunch of these, and I want you to have one. Just to, so I said, oh, well, thanks, John. And, uh, at any rate, it was the first time I'd ever been sent a necktie for. Oh, yeah, no women allowed. Yeah, at any rate. Oh. Uh, it's too much copy in this one also, but it, it's, I just thought since, it's almost 40 years later, I just, it, this is 1988, imagining uh, with global warming and everything else. Um, uh, so we've got Green Mountain Mangoes, earning the scenic quality. You know, I don't know, I mean, is this, is this really hard for people to read? Yeah. Well, it's probably not worth it. It's a bunch of dumb jokes. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that, that's... <laughs> yeah, par uh, the parrots become our state... Uh, unfortunately, the hermit thrush, who is our state bird, is in serious decline, so we may have to get a new bird. Of course, a lot of birds are in serious decline. And yeah, and I have to, I want to also, it's probably an inappropriate time, but to thank Jeb for all of his bird photography. I love all your bird photography. And um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, um, um, oh, and then this, this one I, is the one I won uh, first prize from the New England Press Association, which kind of baffles me because it's not that good, but that, that I got for his prize anyway. But um, that's about the only reason I included it. But, uh, it says, <coughs> uh, Leahy is saying, what, the bovine growth hormone? All of Vermont's against it? Well, <laughs> I've really not made up my mind about it. Why do you ask? And, you know, with the, he's kind of in the lap of the chemical companies. I don't know. It's kind, of, it's kind of funny to have these Leahy cartoons because he's been so great. Um, uh, and this is Chief, Ju Chief Justice Rehnquist, who ac actually also went to Kenyon College, as it turned out, for a little bit. And it says, Supreme Court is that internal bodily search is allowed if person poses threat to public safety. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, and it's, it's starting to be a little bit of an echo of what might be to come here. The enemy within. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't think it would be that password. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At any rate, um, this one I just kind of like the cartoon. It was the only time I've signed my name name in Arabic. Also, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Ralph Wright was. Oh, Tony probably can. Got stories about that of him, but it's, uh, he's he was quite a quite a character, a lot of lot of fun. He was. Um, this is probably really hard to see, isn't it? Hmm. All right. Well. Anyway, so here's Peter Welch. <coughs> Back in the day, it, it took so long for him to finally get elected somewhere. He he had campaign after campaign, and uh, you know now he's just he, you know, he's so important to the state. But he's it just he ran many unsuccessful campaigns. So uh, it says uh, cartoons of dust bowl days and under the dry well of cam campaign contributions. <coughs> anyway. Shoot, I feel badly. This is, this is hard for people to see this stuff. All right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and then <laughs> at, the, at the time, nobody could believe it, Bernie, Bernie pulled off this run for Congress. <laughs> yeah, so we've got the you know, regular person saying unbelievable, George Bush the first <laughs> saying unbelievable, and Bernie saying unbelievable. <laughs> on his way to D.C. And here's, uh, yeah, um, 
sorry. I just feel badly. This is like, like I mean, everybody's sitting here. You can't even see anything. <laughs> um, at any rate, it says, it says Snelling, right after his campaign, you know, the party hats and whatnot everywhere, just saying, now that you mentioned that, I don't see a light at the other end of the tunnel either, you know, with all the problems and deficit and democratic control of, of the legislature, et cetera. But, uh, I kind of like the drawing. <laughs> And once he was in, after all the you know years of um, Madeline Kunin with all of the you know, environmental regulations and Act 200 and whatnot, he had Snelling went went to work erasing a lot of or trying trying to eradicate a lot of what Kunin had done. And, uh, oops. However, he didn't last very long in office <laughs> the last time. That was, uh, it was, I just remember that. It's a shocking moment when he was found next to his pool having had a heart attack. I mean, it was, nobody expected it. And Jeffords, back when, this is Bush, saying, well, a man with convictions, we'll see how far that gets you at home. <laughs> you know, Jeffords walking away with this independent voting record. And, uh, he went from being kind of a moderate Republican to now you know, kind of a state hero. Oh, and when after I left the Savoy um, at my office, I, I went over to 138 Main Street where I still do have an office. And at the time, uh, my first office that was downstairs. It was right next to Jeffords uh, Congressional. It was before he was elected to the Senate he, when he was a congressman. Uh, and his office is right next door. So I'd be, I shared an office with uh, Doug Wilhelm, who a bunch of you probably know, um, notable because he's 6'11", and, and I'm not. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and he was uh, working uh, for the Boston Globe. He was the Vermont stringer for the Boston Globe. And um, so Jeffords, when he was in town, would always come in and he'd have a six pack of beer, walk in the door and throw Doug and I each a can of beer and it'd plop down in, the, in, the, in one of our chairs and just shoot the breeze for an hour. And so it was great. He was the nicest guy. It just, it was it just, I mean, he wasn't trying to push an agenda or a story. He was just, it was really, it was really fun. Um, uh, then we get to the flood. Was that, was that 92 or 93? I, I can't read it from here either. <laughs> so, is it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so there I, I was, I mean, my office was at 138 Main Street, which is pretty much across from the library. And it was, yeah, that was underwater. And we all got evacuated by boat. <coughs> and uh, I had my viola. I, was, I had orchestra practice. So, I, so there was a shot that was in the paper with me with my viola case going being paddled across to the library. And, uh, but in the mean, while all this was happening, all these politicians kept uh, showing up out there. I mean, just doing nothing but, yeah. Yeah. here we are. <laughs> <laughs> See me? I'm, I'm involved. And, uh, and it was, I mean, this really did. I mean, Ralph Wright, I mean, these, these were actual scenes. Ralph White Wright was in a backhoe. And he, they had the, the uh, bucket lifted up high. And he and he was it, it was just he was going through town, you know, on the top of this backhoe, and uh, it was Jeb Spaulding, and I guess it was Bill Doyle he was with, in some army truck sloshing through. <laughs> At any rate, oh, and this in the meantime, Madeline Cunin was out looking for work, and uh. She was she was pretty relentless and trying to, yeah, and, and she was successful and you know and good for her. You know, and she eventually got a job. Um, uh, yeah. She was eventually U.S. ambassador to Switzerland. She had another one before that. I'm forgetting was Secretary of Education or something. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, the, the caption says that ba that banging. It's been going on for two elections now. Can't we just give her a post? 
But I always kind of like the drawing of Clinton and Kunin in that one. And, um, in the meantime, <laughs> we've got I guess this is the Re Republican Party headquarters hanging up a poster of Howard Dean, honorary member in good standing. The caption says, now hang on, the government governor may look Republican, he may talk Republican, act Repu Republican, but he's not, a rep he's not a party member yet. So take it down, the poster. <laughs> Which was an amazing one, I, I guess some of these pr other cartoons, that there was such a difference between the dean who was governor here and the dean who was running for president. It was two very different people. And one of, uh, it was one of these times, I was flying back on a plane from Washington, D.C., and I had my laptop, and I was working on, uh, my cartoons I always, uh, do on the weekends and then send them in Monday morning. And so it was a Sunday evening flight back and I was working on retouching this cartoon and who walks down the aisle but Howard Dean <laughs> and he sits right in front of me. And I thought, you've, you've got to be kidding. So I was sitting there with my laptop doing what I could in Photoshop, you know, in, in behind him thinking, this is unbelievable. There's, there's this guy going. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, this goes along with it, you know, the dean said, I'm happy to say we've passed the budget, a responsible budget, not like the Cunin years. Tax and spend, tax and spend, every last cent. Bunch of creepy, knuckle-headed liberal Democrats. And then when people down below say, so shouldn't somebody remind him that he is a Democrat? <laughs> and the other, the other person says, it's technicality only. Anyway. Oh, and then this, this is great. Good old Fred Tuttle. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I remember during, during that election, how many people crossed over to uh, the primary to vote uh, <laughs> Republicans. So the cartoon is, you know, the town clerk saying, gee, Marge. I thought Marge might be here. Um, gee, Marge, I'm amazed at how many new Republicans there seem to be and people that... Yeah. <laughs> At any rate, that that was that was he was so much fun. Um, on the other side, then we have. Do you, you remember? Was it Fred? Mask, whatever his name is. Was it Mas Maslack? Mas I was just blanking out his Tony. Do you remember him? Um, I, he was, I, he, I don't really think he lasted long, but here's this guy, he was, he was a Republican uh, House member who um, decided he had had it with, with people who didn't own guns, and he, he thought, if, you know, you either own a gun, if you don't, you're going to be fined $500, and your name's going to go on the list, and I mean, it was really kind of incredible. It was picked up all over the country, I mean, all these gun rights groups just thought he was the best thing ever. So, oh, and, and, uh, and this quote in the middle is, w is actually a, a, a quote that he, he used, it wasn't me. You know, the first panel says, Republican Maslach told me I'd have to buy a gun or be fined $500. And he also said we all needed military training, which is something else he said. It's, then he got right in my face and asked, and this is a direct quote from him, do sniveling limp wimps like you know what to do when faced with tyrannizing state officials? The last panel says, so I, I, I had to admit that I did, so I shot him. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, fair, fair enough. <laughs> oh, yeah. So then Dean, Dean passed it. Civil unions law, and which then gave seed to the take take back Vermont movement. And these signs got up. So anyway, I have a f Alex Forbes is in here somewhere, and I think Alex had something to do with this cartoon. I think you gave me the idea. Wherever you are, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I think I think you came up with that that line, which was a great line. <laughs> Um, at any rate, 
So it says, take Vermont backwards, and the caption is, why, Harry, your signs are finally getting to the point. <laughs> you know. And Ruth Dwyer, good old Ruth Dwyer, <laughs> you know, she, she was kind of leading the charge on uh, fake news and, um, you know, who cares about the truth. Uh, and she, she went on about being a native Vermont farmer when yeah, she was born in New Jersey or somewhere? Ohio. Ohio? Oh, Ohio. I should know. Okay. Okay, yeah. And oh, Ruth Dwyer, who ran for governor. And, uh, oh, it says right there on the thing, born in Ohio, raised in Long Island. Okay, never. Yeah. Yeah. So at any rate, there she is with her Pinocchio nose and <laughs> the guy saying, are we a little fact check challenged? And the other one says, well, it does cut down on the firewood expenses. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, she, she, she was, uh, as far as the cartooning, uh, cartoonist goes, she was a great source of material. You know, as were these people, the Republican six-pack. Now, Tony, you've got to, you have to remember some of these guys. I mean, these were, it was just this group, I think they're mostly from the Northeast Kingdom, of just these angry, uh, just, uh, I don't know. I had a great time drawing this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's growlers. Yeah, so Jim Douglas then decided, after being a meek and mild treasurer, it was, and a number of other posts, that he was, he was going to run for governor. And uh, guys coming in. Douglas says, oh, I can't answer that question. Uh, it's, it's too soon to stay. Uh, why are you asking? No comment. And the guy is saying, once again, Mr. Douglas, please, did you order the pepperoni or cheese pizza? pizza? <laughs> and then the guy, the little guy in the back says, actually, he ordered the milk toast. Here we go again. So uh, it's anyway. Again, I'm sorry to repeat this for people who can see it, but if you can't, it's so this is Douglas sitting in a chair and is uh, saying, a "Poll worker, or, uh, I don't know, somebody in the staff saying you're behind in the gubernatorial polls, Treasurer Douglas. People don't find you very exciting." And he said, "Hmm. No one knows where you stand because you never offer an opinion." He said, "Huh." He said, we need some information. Spire, fire us up. Why should you be elected? He said, because it's my turn. <laughs> which, which he actually, I think, he said <laughs> on occasion. <laughs> Meanwhile, that, that same midterm election, the Democrats lost their uh, the, uh, uh, Congress. So you know, Jeffords and Leahy, who had great assignments, were now as they are here at the Energy Committee, the ductwork cleaning subgroup. And Jefferson is saying, hey, what do you know? We've been assigned to the same committee. <laughs> ah, and here they are again, the Republican six-pack. This, this was after 9-11. And uh, here to guide your personal morality is kind of dressed up as Taliban. But yeah, they were. They uh, they were they were really fun to draw. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess this is when yeah Dean Dean started his candidacy, which at the time was c was considered a really dark horse. And, uh, yeah, so he's got a little hoof. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. I guess I I should pick it up. My my minder is telling me to. Uh, so I can I can flip through a lot of these. I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize I'd been blathering this long. Um, so anyway, so Howard Dean. Yeah. So there he was. Suddenly, at one summer, he was everywhere. Everywhere you looked. 
and he got a guitar, and suddenly the, the dean we had never seen in Vermont suddenly was out there. <laughs> it was, you know, yeah, yeah. And, but he still had to walk a tightrope of you know, anti-war candidate and all-American candidate. And he did it pretty well until he screamed. <laughs> God forbid. I mean, every, everything going on now, you just can't believe somebody goes, Aah! and that's, that's the end of a campaign. I mean, nowadays, you do anything, and it just doesn't matter. You can say anything. It doesn't matter. Yeah. No, um, occasionally, like uh, seven days, I, I mean, I, I, I'm in seven days every week, and the editors will say, uh, it's, it's pretty rare. If they have a, an issue, if I've gotten something wrong, uh, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty rare, but they, they do keep an eye on it and, and, just, and try to fix it if, it if it's just factually wrong, if I've got something in there which I greatly appreciate. <laughs> it's nice to have somebody watching out for me. Um, but then he did scream. <laughs> and John Kerry is saying, oh, excellent, toast. <laughs> and he's popping up out of the toaster oven. <laughs> you know, so. Uh, usually involves staring at a blank piece of paper with a deadline hanging over my head, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Do you ever get like total writer's block and just can't come up with something? Well, the nice thing, you know, at this point, I was doing two cartoons a week for a, a number of years, and I'm just doing one a week now, and so you, you've got the whole week to think about it. And, I mean, there are really slow news weeks, and, you know, and that's where you pull out the weather cartoons and <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> zucchini cartoons. <laughs> We've got too many zucchini. Although, I, it was a zucchini cartoon. I had so many angry letters <laughs> over, <laughs> how dare you make fun of zucchini and food? There, <laughs> there are people starving around the world, you know. And, 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 and then I had somebody being hauled off uh, by guys in the white coats after having way too many pieces of zucchini bread and zucchini cake and <laughs> zucchini muffins. <laughs> and then some people said, Alex, sorry, but it's, it, the people were saying, oh, how dare you make fun of people with you know, mental health issues. But it was a zucchini cartoon. It was not, it was just supposed to be, it was supposed to be light. But there's always somebody out there yeah, somebody's always on the edge of their seat waiting to get to be offended. So, all right, I, I'll, I'm sorry. I tell, I'm, I've got a long way to go. And I, so, I don't know, Allison, or should I shut up? <laughs> well, I can, I can rip through this. Okay. Anyway, so um, uh, I didn't think it was going to go so long. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, this Vermont Yankee character, this was, this was Mark, 2004 was the first time I kind of took Vermont Yankee off the ground and turned him into what started this whole, so that was, that was my first shot at it, at, at kind of animating Vermont Yankee. Um, you know, he still went back being in the ground here for a little bit, um, you know, uh, and then gradually became a little more animated. I worked on the character. There he was. I think this was the last time without diapers, without the depends, rather. Um, oh, no, there's another one. Um, oh, there he is. So, and I have to give credit to Shay Totten, who um, was the editor of Vermont Times uh, for a while, before it became Seven Days. And uh, he was up in my office at one point and, and just said, you know, you ought, to put, you ought to put this guy in a pair of Depends. And I thought, he's just always leaking. And I thought, 
I thought, oh God, that's just brilliant. So I cannot, I cannot take credit for this, but it was one of the best ideas ever. So with the NRC, he's, the, the hurdles were always set as low as possible. And Vermont Yankee kept leaping over the two inch high hurdle. And, uh, and, uh, so here the, the Depends are now pulled up. And, um, and I, I did a separate thing on Tritium. I like the Tritium character, because tri Tritium is the, um, uh, was the radioactive particle that was leaking and getting into the Connecticut River and whatnot. So I, had, I ran a piece in a story, was seven days or something, I was doing a story on in explaining this. So here's Tritium jumping out of the subset of the, of the hydrogen uh, molecule. Um, and then in the end, so here was it, that ended up being a cover for seven days. And that's kind of in his fully developed form. And, um, but the amazing thing was, I, which I had no idea was going on, when there, in the legislature, and Tony, you were probably there for this, um, uh, when, when there was going to be a vote on trying to retire Vermont Yankee, and I th I'm not sure, I think it was David Blutersdorf maybe, Oh, it was a bit, oh, it was a horrible day. It was just, yeah, it was a terrible day. But th some, I think with David Blursdorf had uh, commissioned this hot air balloon uh, in, in my, uh, made up to be my Vermont Yankee character. And somebody, I think it was Paul Burns at Vperg or something, said, you've got to get over there. You've got to see this thing. So I ran over. It was a horrible, just a horrible day. So unfortunately, it meant nobody was outside. But, uh, but I got some good shots. I was just kind of amazed that, this this cartoon character turned into this this big balloon. And, uh, uh, at any rate, then uh, endless energy cartoons. But they want to wreck our ridge, ridge lines with more wind tar. Since when do we need all these new energy sources? <laughs> you know, as as we all sit surrounded more and more by more and more devices. And, uh, and Jerry Tarrant. He was a character. I've got him in the sugar cane. He said, Bernie doesn't support our farm programs, but the farm programs stink. Bernie favors big sugar over dairy. Where's my script writer? Where are we anyway? And his assistant says, lost in the sugar cane, sir. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'm going to pick this up just because I'm sorry it's so late. Uh, so anyway, I just like this drawing. Douglas being chased out of town meeting. And George Bush eating crow. <laughs> and Peter Welch having graduated to the Senate. Or no, uh, yeah, yeah, filling, filling big shoes. Of I'm, I'm sorry, he, getting elected to the House, rather, and, and filling Bernie's oversized shoes. There's Douglas throwing Efficiency Vermont out with the bathwater, the energy bill veto. And I always liked this one. I, this actually was a, I turned into a Christmas card one year <laughs> for our family. <laughs> So it says, so these are the carbon footprints we've all been hearing so much about. <laughs> now, if you can see, the, the chimney soot footprints is Santa last. Anyway, I've just always liked that one. <laughs> and we've got Neil Lunderville, who ended up being a great, great character, with a little beanie on his head. Um, So this one we have the state revenue projections, the car going over the cliff and guy throwing shumlin say, Hey you, quick grab on, save us. So they're throwing him a life preserver saying new taxes. Just another one I liked. <laughs> and then these were uh, uh, these tiger teams which were uh, kind of groups of people Douglas put together to advance 
his agenda, <clears throat> and a lot of the people just really had no experience or anything, and but it was just an excuse to put Neil Lunderville in a little tiger costume. And, uh, and th this one is a population cartoon. <clears throat> And this this one went all over the place. I mean, not just in Vermont, but I actually had somebody <coughs> who was in a, a farmer's market in Hobart, Tasmania. And this thing, they saw this blown up into a big poster on the farmer's market, and they took a picture of it and sent it to me. He said, do you realize your cartoons are being printed in Tasmania? They said, no. Anyway. <laughs> but it's a, yeah. So uh, anyway. It, so we've got to deal with the root cause of global warming. And the guy says, right, let's talk sustainability. Let's talk clean energy, sustainable agriculture, carbon footprints. And actually, and the woman says, actually, how about we talk about sustainable human population, which <coughs> is obviously the root problem with all of this. And the guy says, well, sorry, we don't talk about that, which nobody does. But, I mean, you can't, I mean, the human population just can't keep growing like this and expect the poor planet to ever survive. <coughs> uh, at any rate, so Shaman's inaugural party, which Sharon and I actually went to, Um, and then Irene, <coughs> the tropical storm, Irene, the guy said, well, it's true, you can't get there from here. <laughs> the only patch of road left in the swirling river. And here comes tritium, which is another. I really enjoyed drawing <laughs> this from my, I was so sad when that finally closed down. I thought, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> There goes a huge, I know, I know, a huge percentage just gone. <laughs> no, but I've had a, a, quite a few people say I really should do a book solely, just all a collection of the Vermont Yankee cartoons, which I thought would be kind of fun. Um, and then, but U.S. ruled, U.S. District Court ruled Vermont Yankee could stay open which Shumlin was not happy about. Uh, this is just, well, this is coming up this weekend, Daylight Savings. Ugh. Where by all the workshops in Sweden I do online, I do completely lose track of what time. It's two o'clock Swedish time. I just say, well, what time is it here? Uh, yeah. So, the Vermont Yankee has been ma major hemorrh hemorrhaging. They said, well, let's be safe to operate. And they said, well, that's always been the question. <laughs> and it's an odd, odd moment when Shap and Shumlin were kind of at odds with each other. Uh, so this marks the first time uh, Seven Days said, okay, we're, we're running all in color now and stop doing your cartoons unless you don't want to in black and white and start doing them in color. So from this May 23rd, 2013, uh, all my cartoons have been in color. And, um, Is that the usual story on yeah. <laughs> which made Vermont Yankee even more colorful. And there he goes. <laughs> it's that death with dignity crowd. <laughs> this one, I just like the drawing. <laughs> it's really, <clears throat> it's a pipeline land grab. Making people feel like <clears throat> life hadn't changed that much since the Middle Ages. Uh, this is Scott Milne and his little Boston whaler <laughs> going after the, the Shumlin destroyer. And oddly, he called me up just this, this summer and wanted me to uh, do a print for him because he wanted to frame this and put it up. And 
I was, I was kind of mistified. I was, took one. So happened 10 years ago. <laughs> but secondly, but that, anyway, so he's got that framed on his wall. Oops. Do you do a lot of touching with like hand on paper? Or are you yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's both. I start off, um, uh, I, I do it completely by hand. At least the black and white part because I like it and um, so, you know and if you have a show then you actually have something physical you can you can hang although that I scan it and then do the colorizing um, on a one of these Wacom Cintiqs it's a it's a big tablet that is pressure sensitive and you can um, program your your pen nibs to, to make it look like brushes and whatnot so I could I could do it all, but it's just I like the process. I start off on tracing paper, doing my rough sketch, then I transfer it onto a bristle board, which I do on the tracing paper. Because if I erase too much on the bristle board, then it ruins the surface of the paper, so the ink gets all messed up. So if I develop it on the tracing paper, then I can transfer it, and it's a pretty reasonable sketch. And then then I ink it in from there, and then scan it. And, um, um, Uh, this is Bernie <coughs> saying, think what you want, but I'm in this thing to win the presidential race with the Clinton machine. This I mainly like the, the drawing. Leahy, Leahy had his multiple trips to Cuba. Okay, okay, all right. Well, let me, okay, I'll just, I'm sorry, I ripped through this. Um, Oh, it's Bill Lee, this is great governor candidate. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Scott's uncomfortable position, which he continues to be in, being stuck between a Democratic majority and the, the rest of the Republican Party. <laughs> and when he first came into office, it just this. Um, the idea that our the Thunder Road most winning race driver now <laughs> related to the back seat. <laughs> and I kind of like this one. This, this is uh, after Scott first got elected, he, he went up to Quebec to do something or other, which means when he's away, then the lieutenant governor takes over. And when he came back, he said, what's this? Pot was legalized while I was away? A carbon tax was passed? They found funding to clean up Lake Champlain? This isn't the budget I wanted. Zuckerman, what's going on? <laughs> Zuckerman says, well, sir, as you know, Lieutenant assumes command when the governor's out of state, so when the cat's away. <laughs> anyway, I always liked that one. And get used to it. <laughs> we may be looking at that again. And that was, that was, from, that was from a long time ago. And then, uh, one of the last, <laughs> Fubont Yankee ready to go. And then, uh, oh, this, this is, and I'm sorry, I'll, I'll finish up here. This is Septic Smart Week. This somebody, in, I, f I forget, some natural resources, or some, some subcommittee decided to invent Septic Smart Week, where we spent an entire week celebrating all things septic system. So <laughs> it was just crying out for a cartoon. <laughs> and uh, and Queros, also really fun to draw, one of the most odious human beings. And the Republicans, this is uh, with the border stuff, and the Republicans were separating children from their parents. And the Republicans said, of course, we're still the, f the family values party. Why do you ask? And same thing. Anyway, do you want me? I, I can just stop if you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Anyway. I'm sorry.